I'm just going to talk about some um, very simple economics. And um, actually, I welcome questions from you. Um, so I'll talk about some simple economics. Um, I won't tell you any answers. I'll just tell you some questions. And your answers are probably better than mine. And then I'll give you some historical examples. That's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so here we go. So I want to talk about forces underlying um, what's called the Euro crisis. And I'll, I'll tell you what the terms are. So here's two, uh, two questions <clears throat> which are big in 2013. They were big in 2012, and they're going to be big in 2014, too. Okay. So um, the first question is, uh, should a country join a currency union? Now, there's two possible answers, yes or no. And um, let me tell you what a currency union is. This is currency. Um, and what it is is two or more countries decide to use one country's currency. That's called a currency union. How that's decided, we'll talk about. <clears throat> so for example, um, there's a currency union in Europe where between 17 and 23 countries use the same currency. I don't know if you know it, the United States is in a currency union with some countries that President Obama does not know are in the currency union. So, so the United States uses US dollars. Panama uses US dollars. President Obama probably knows that. So now, so now we ask President Obama, who else uses US dollars? I think he'd probably say, I don't, nobody. Well, well Ecuador uses US dollars. We'd say, are you done? And uh, um, Zimbabwe now uses US dollars. Those are the countries I know. And um, the fact that he doesn't know that is kind of significant, because um, he doesn't care. They have chosen to use US dollars um, and not to have their own currency for various reasons. Okay. <clears throat> so should a country join a currency union? Those, those countries, Panama, Ecuador, and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, the country with one of the biggest inflations in recent years, chose to use that government, which is a very leftist government, chose to use the US dollar <clears throat> as a way to get out of in hyperinflation. They don't have hyperinflation now. So they chose. So they answered the question, yes. Okay, so here's another question. Should a country exit a currency union? That's actually under consideration with at least one of those countries. So, and, and various countries in Europe are facing this, country, this question. And you may ask which countries are facing that in Europe. We'll come back to that. So the answers to these questions are yes, no, yes, no. So I want to say these are superficial questions. Those aren't the real questions. And if we want to make progress in thinking about these questions, we have to ask um, other questions, in my, in my opinion. So here we go. So these are the deeper questions. <clears throat> And I told you, I'm not going to give you any answers. Should a government pay its debts? So, so let me tell you what I mean by that. The government, um, I don't have any bonds because I don't own any. But the government of the United States and various countries have issued pieces of paper that say, I promise to pay you US dollars in the future, and I promise to pay you a stream of interest payments. Those are promises. So the question is, um, should a government honor those promises? And I'm going to argue that, those, that that's a deeper question than the previous one. And the answer is going to, I'm going to say yes, no, tell you why. <clears throat> like an economist, like Milton Friedman would say, I'm going to do costs and benefits. I'm going to make a, um, I'm going to make a spreadsheet, what do we call it, a spreadsheet, there's going to be that. the pluses, the costs, the, no, the pluses are the benefits and the costs in the side. I'm going to write them down. I'm going to stare at them. And I'm going to come up with yes or no, should I pay to get out debts? OK, so that's the first question. Should a single government pay its debts? Second question is, in a federal system or in a confederal system, <clears throat> like the United States has, it has a central government 
in 50 states. Or um, Argentina and Brazil, each of those has a central government in many provinces. Or, I don't know anything about this, but I think China has a central government and a bunch of provinces. So the question is, in a federal system, should a central government pay debts incurred by subordinate governments? Oops, that was a mistake. Or was it? <clears throat> okay. Those are going to be our questions. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these deep questions and give you the answers, like an economist. <clears throat> so this is the, the economist, um, this is the economist's romantic approach to life, or non-romantic. I'm thinking, should I get married? Um, <laughs> spreadsheet. <laughs> Benefits. Costs. <laughs> you know, okay. Benefits. She's fun to be around. Costs. I have to clean up my room. You know, <laughs> just good done. It's like, okay, this is it. And we're going to, okay, good. That's the approach. Okay. <clears throat> Should a country pay its debts? So, first, I'm going to tell you a reason not to pay. Simplest possible reason it's costly to pay. And, and why is it costly to pay? So how are you going to pay your debts? <clears throat> you have to tax your taxpayers, get them to pay you money, the government money, which the mon government then turns over and, and gives directly to the bondholders. So why is that costly? Well, if you pay taxes, you know it's costly. But also, taxes are distorting. When you, when, when you like if you're an economics student, you know that taxes are typically imposed <clears throat> on things like sales taxes and income taxes, and those distort marginal decisions. They disrupt the information content of prices, and they cause misallocations of resources. They cause bigger misallocations, the bigger the tax rates. So that's the cost. So if you're going to pay your, if, you, if a government has a big debt, my government has a big debt, it's going to be costly to pay those. And um, we could get out of those talk, we could get out of those uh, taxes by saying to um, our bondholders, some of whom are very close here, and they don't vote in China, uh, we're sorry. And uh, that would reduce the burden on, on U.S. taxpayers. Okay, good. And by the way, that's happened before. Okay, so that's a good reason not to pay. So what's the reason to pay? Well, you might want to borrow again. Um, if you pay existing debts, it fosters a good reputation among your prospective creditors. This is a reputational argument. If you were absolutely sure you would never want to borrow again, if you were absolutely sure you were never going to borrow, and you had, and let's say you could save, so by, by saving, you could smooth your consumption over time. This was the last time you were ever going to have to borrow. It is not in your interest to pay your debts. Because you can evade your taxes. You can avoid the taxes. Um, and you can get higher benefits. So, so one of the most famous uh, models in economic, macroeconomic theory is by Robert Lucas and Nancy Stokey. It's a model of optimal taxation. And it tells you, if you can, default on your initial debt. Um, and that comes through in a lot of models. So this is a force, a reason not to pay. Um, but, so the reason to pay is um, if defaulting costs you a reputation for honoring your future debt, that's a reason to pay. So now, whether or not a country should pay, it's a balance of those two forces. It's a balance of those two forces. So I'm going to revisit these two forces in, um, with some lessons from American history. Because my country, <clears throat> the United States, was born in a struggle between these questions, and, and, and it, between these two answers, and it was a close struggle. Um, one side ended up sort of winning, but it, it almost didn't happen. So I want to tell you about that balance. And um, 
Okay. Okay, so should, should a country pay its debts? And I, later I'm going to link this to these, um, should a country join a currency union? Because it's about this. Okay. So actually, we could take a poll at this time. How many think a country, oh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but you should ask yourself, do you think a co your country should pay your debts? And I have a prediction. I have a prediction. Some of you, I can tell from your facial expressions, some of you are bondholders. <laughs> and your, your parents set up a fund for you to go to college, and what's it's those interest payments? Okay, you're bondholders, and you say, yes, the United States should pay its debts. Some of you are not bondholders, and you're taxpayers. And you think, uh, no, why should I? No. So, so don't expect everybody to give the same answers to these questions. And don't expect the same person to give this answer when he's a young person, only a taxpayer, and when he's an old person, and he's a bondholder. So interests are divided about this. So there's going to be no, it's not like, a, this isn't calculus or algebra. There's no unique right answer here. Okay. Now, here's the fun part. Okay, fun question. Okay, so should a government bail out subordinate governments? And of course, I already told you. I'm going to tell you uh, yes and no. I'm going to give you reasons. Okay, so should a central government bail out subordinate governments? Um, and you'll see why, as an American, this is a sensitive question to me. Okay. Um, it's an enduring question, which is right below the surface in the United States today. So here's a reason not to bail out. Um, it's called moral hazard. And it is this, um, bailing out subsidizes or rewards subordinate government's profligacy and creates incentives for them to want subsequent bailouts. Do you understand this? Do you, like, do you have a brother or sister who's asked for bailouts? You understand? And you bail them out? and then you expect that's the last time? Do you think that's going to be the last time? You understand? So what moral hazard is, is if I insure you or bail, bail you out, it affects your incentives for your future behavior. So a reason not to bail out is, to, and notice this is about creating expectations about your future behavior that has an effect on the other person's future behavior. So a reason not to bail out is I tell you, I'm not going to bail you out. Oh, I'm in such a bad way. You know, come on. No. Then I say, oh, I better get my act together. That's the idea. That's moral hazard. So um, good reason not to bail out is to say no. Okay.